Hi, I'm Michael Baruch. Uh, I'm a graphic designer who works in New York at a place called Pentagram. As a kid, I was one of those children who was interested in drawing and art. That was my special talent, if I had one. Um, but I also really liked, um, as opposed to just drawings and paintings, I liked lettering and posters and music packaging and the titles at the beginning of movies. I liked all those things. And then it took me a while to figure it out. Um, but that all turned out to be something called design, and specifically graphic design. And I was lucky I, uh, I found that out when I was fairly young, uh, a teenager, probably about 14 or 15 years old, and um, decided that's what I wanted to do, and it all pretty much came out as planned. My favorite thing about graphic design is that if you if you sort of take advantage of all that it offers as a profession, you get to act almost as a spy in the world. Because graphic designers have the opportunity to work in so many different situations, if you're curious, you can find yourself in all these funny places where you wouldn't have ever expected to be. So I've been in professional football team locker rooms. I've been in the front front page meeting at the New York Times. I've been in the operating rooms of hospitals. I've been uh, in all sorts of different places in my role as a graphic designer. Now that's because I'm there to do an annual report or I'm there to design a new logo or I'm there to do something. But um, because people sort of don't get exactly what it takes for me to do these things, um, I can tell them, well, I really would like to come and visit you and get a sense of what you're all about. Young graphic designers who are looking for their first job, um, so they have different priorities sometimes, and if they ask people for advice, they would get different advice. I always give the same advice, though, which is to find someone who does work that you really admire and see if you can get a job helping that person. Um, a young graphic designer who's a recent graduate from, uh, from art school or a university program has usually been in an environment that um, you'll look back on as being very encouraging and nurturing. Uh, when you start working professionally in that real world, um, what you learn right away is how hard it is actually to, um, to, to make design actually come to fruition in the world. You know, how, it's easy to come up with the design ideas. It turns out that's the easy part, the thing you've been learning how to do in school. And it's easy actually even to get the design ideas down on paper. What's hard to do is one, to convince people to let you do the design for them, get work. Uh, two, once you convince them to give you the work, to convince them to accept the work you've done as the right thing they should do. Three, once they've done that, they'll tell you then, if they didn't tell you before, oh, whoops, it has to be done this fast and for this little money. And those are all things that, um, each one of which provides lots and lots and lots of excuses for things to look not so great, which is why if you look around the world, most things look pretty bad. It's because every, and it's not because people are like waking up every morning thinking I'm gonna design crappy looking things. It's because, you know, the world isn't uh, designed to make everything be great. The world's designed to make everything look average. That's what the definition of average is. So if what you wanna do is do something that's excellent. Your enemy is everything, basically. Sometimes a client will take the very first thing you design with no revisions at all. It's fairly rare, but it happens. Um, I've even had one client uh, where I've had you know, three different options to show, and this client has said, stop right there after the first one. I don't need to see anything else. So I had two other ideas that I just never even produced, took out of the envelope to show. That's pretty rare, though. More common is, you know, um, you know, the essence of designing something is creating something new. And new things by their nature are original and hence unfamiliar. And they're not unfamiliar to you because you design them and you've been spending time with them. But a lot of times you expect someone to just see them in the first second and get right away what it, what it is and why it's good. And I've learned that that doesn't happen that often. Again, when you're a student, you sort of, 
what you're learning in design school as you're studying design is uh, um, how to be a designer. And what you're forgetting is what it was like to not be a designer. And then what you usually forget the moment you graduate is that no one else is a designer. You're actually, you've spent uh, time and uh, tuition becoming, you know, different than normal people because you know these things and you have this certain taste level and stuff. And then you sort of think, well, why don't, why doesn't everyone agree with me? Well, they don't because they didn't go to design school. Why should they, you know? Um, so what happens a lot of times is that you um, have this uh, heightened sense of design that actually is a little bit different from other people. And you have to um, uh, remember that uh, uh, for someone to really come along with you and, and to a design solution, it really helps them to feel like they're part of the process. They're seeing the sequence of decisions that you made. And sometimes they're really, you know, if certain, uh, so sometimes you work with people where this is a really, really unf unfamiliar um, uh, kind of process. You know, if you you know if you work with business people, they're used to telling whether something's right or wrong by taking out a calculator and adding it up. Which one costs more than the other one? Which one will make more money than the other one? Which one is better or worse? And then all of a sudden you're just showing them two shapes and color. You know, these things that actually are require intuition or taste or leaps of faith to make a decision about. And in those cases, it actually is, um, uh, you're asking them to do something that's really outside of their comfort zone, as they say. And the way you actually reduce that gap, they reduce the, 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 the distance of the leap you're going to ask them to make, is by helping them sort of understand the process that led you up to that point. And hopefully and then you can just make a little skip across the gap and you're there. In my experience, the best way to get a new client is to... Um, uh, do good work for the client that you currently have. And then that work gets out there, someone sees that, and they come and they say, I saw that thing you did, and I'd love to see you do more of it for me. Uh, in the old days, back when I was a brand new graduate in 1980, that was a, uh, a tough hill to climb uh, to get work done you really needed to um, you know, get hired, to get it seen, the work had to be produced, to get it widely seen, it had to be published. Uh, you know, people who are graduating this June have a tremendous advantage because there's this thing called the internet, there's all sorts of other social media available. So if you're productive, you can get projects out there in the, available to be viewed around the world just from uh, the privacy of your own computer. First impressions probably matter um, when you're meeting a new client the same way they matter when you're meeting anyone else, I would say. Um, it's nice to smile and look people in the eye and seem friendly, although I know some successful designers who I don't think make particularly good first impressions. Uh, and maybe, I'm not even sure I make a really good first impression to tell you the truth. So um, I think, you know, you could actually argue that in the case of designers, and this isn't something you should take to heart, but I, I think that because, um, unlike so many other people that uh, one would encounter in a business situation, you know, designers actually can demonstrate what it is they do. Uh, my, my wife's not a designer. She graduated with an MBA when I graduated with a design degree. And so she went looking for work in marketing as a business person. And I remember like she would talk about the interview she had and they just sounded awful. Just like sitting and talking and looking at the person. They ask you a question and you answer the question. Like I just couldn't figure out how people got jobs that way. It seemed horrible. I would go to my interviews. I just would have my portfolio. You know, and I'd, I'd get someone to agree to let me show my work. And then I, and then I, I could be, you know, picking my nose or falling asleep or, you know, um, you know, blowing bubble gum bubbles, you know, while they, I didn't do any of those things. Uh, but I could have been while they were looking at my portfolio because it sort of was, you know, and, and they would often think, well, I, I assume they'd think, well, if this guy is just a nose picking, gum chewing, um, n narcoleptic, you know, we'll just sit him in the back and not let him in, see any important clients. So it helps to actually have a talent that you can actually demonstrate and make manifest. And I, I do think, um, you know, I'm not sure first impressions are important. I do think, you know, passion and sincerity and being an honest person and being a person that seems genuinely curious in other people 
um, are all attributes that, that, that I associate with good designers. And, um, and so to the degree that you sort of sense that when you meet a designer, I think it probably makes some difference. So I'd been working for another designer uh, for 10 years. Uh, my first job out of school was from Massimo Vignelli. I worked for him for 10 years. And I was ready for something else, but I sort of didn't quite, I never wanted to work all by myself in a, in a, in a, in a little room. Uh, I like having people around, but I was sort of yearning for some degree of independence and yet have the collegiality of a larger group. And lucky for me, the one place that uh, offers that combination, it seems, is Pentagram. And I happen to know some of the partners there. Uh, we had a conversation about me joining as a partner, and so I did. And that was uh, 1990. That's uh, going on 21 years ago. Uh, so I've been, um, 22 years ago, who's counting? Uh, so it's, um, it's been a very nice experience for me, a good combination. When I joined, I was like the youngest partner in the partnership. Now, I've, in the New York office, I've been there the longest, just barely longer than uh, Paul Asher, who joined six months after me. And so it's uh, gone by very quickly, but it's been a really good environment for me to uh, learn about design, to learn from my uh, uh, clients and my partners and the designers who I've worked with there. Um, I published a book a few years ago called 79 Short Essays on Design. As promised, if you get this book, it does have 79 essays. They are all relatively short, just a few pages each, and they're all mostly about one aspect or, of design or another. Um, a lot of them came, were adapted from or came directly from a blog that I've worked on for some time now called Design Observer that I co-founded with uh, Bill Drentel, Jessica Helfand, and Rick Pointer. Uh, designobserver.com. If you don't want to buy the book, you can just go there and there's plenty to read that I wrote uh, for free. Um, the book takes some of those essays and some other things that I wrote in other places and come, puts them between um, two covers. And what's actually the most entertaining thing about the physical book is not my idea, but one of my partner's ideas. I went to uh, um, Abbott Miller, who's one of Pentagram's partners in our New York office, and I asked him to um, uh, come up with a format for the book, and he had this idea that every one of the 79 essays should be set in a different typeface. And so coming up with what typeface each of the 79 essays is set in became this really fun adventure. And, um, and the book, has, it's about design, but it has no pictures at all. The only visual interest really is the switching around of these typefaces as you go from essay number one to essay number 79 in the end. And um, sometimes they're like little embedded jokes that I put in to amuse myself that you may or may not uh, get, and if you get them, you may or may not appreciate them or think they're funny, but it does uh, supply a little bit of visual interest for people who care to go that extra mile and get the physical book as opposed to reading online or in other ways. A lot of times I, I surprise myself by finding inspiration not from visual things, like things in museums, although they can be inspiring and I have been inspired by them. Uh, not from um, even creative things like music, which I also find inspiring. But um, every once in a while I'll encounter like a phrase or a statement that's either something famous, someone famous said it or someone not so famous said it, that all of a sudden will sort of snap something into uh, focus for me. So for instance, um, I was working on this uh, project a few months ago where it was going really badly. It's a big, important project, complicated thing to solve, uh, large-scale work to be done. It wasn't just like a book cover, it's like a big thing. And um, I, just, I just couldn't get it. We were having meetings with the client where I would go in with presentations. and. Uh, I just would think, you know, I don't think this is right, but let's say, I'll go in with this, at least we can start talking about it. And in a situation like that, I'll say, I'm not sure this is right, um, but this is an approach we've got. And I think they sort of thought it wasn't quite right either, and I didn't think it was quite right, but I just kind of like, you know, from one meeting to the next to the next, I just kind of like started getting into this groove with this thing that I just didn't, deep down inside, didn't think was kind of working. And um, then I encountered a quote from the illustrator Seymour Quast, uh, which was, um, 
if you're digging a hole in the wrong place, making it deeper doesn't help. And I, I, I read that and I thought, oh my God, that's exactly what I'm doing. I sort of, I'm digging this hole in the wrong place and instead of like standing up and, and looking around and figuring out where it should really be, I just keep making it deeper and deeper and deeper, thinking, you know, if this is the deepest hole in the world, no one will care where it is, you know? And, and like I swear, the very next morning I actually started on a different direction with the help of one of my partners and, uh, um, and got the thing right after that. You know, but it was, it was actually reading that phrase, oddly enough. It wasn't like seeing anything or being inspired by something. All those things play, to, you know, play roles, but it was just kind of like getting some advice. If I could do everything all over again, and I had the luxury of time and maybe even the luxury of money, I wouldn't have gone into graphic design quite so fast. Um, I would have studied, I would have gotten a you know, degree in political science or you know, comparative literature or something first, and then gone into design. I mean, I decided like, you know, when I was so young that this is what I wanted to do. I got into a program where you were able to take foundation graphic design classes from your freshman year. And so it was like all in from day one. All three of my kids went to, um, uh, went to colleges where they actually got a much broader education, read books that I'll probably never get around to reading, took classes that I'd love to take that would, you know, I hope one day I could take in some form, but I may never get a chance to. You know, and they've actually used that moment in time to actually get a broader education, and I sort of regret that I didn't do that myself. So the, the good news is, is that I was able to kind of um, pick things up here or there just on the job, and I, I have a job that lets me do that, which is great. If I wasn't a designer, I think I would like to do something that my freshman year college roommate does occasionally, which is he knows how to play the piano and he plays the piano like in um, hotel lobbies and cocktail lounges and things like that. I just, I just love, I think that's like, being able to, first, first of all, I, I can play the piano a little bit but really badly and to be able to play the piano well I just think is, would be so amazing. All three of my kids took piano lessons and all of them at one point could play the piano a lot better than me. Um, my son can play the piano now much better than I could. Um, and my daughter, my older daughter, could play classical piano much better than I ever could. And so, good for them. But um, my, my roommate, Charlie, was just like, to watch him play the piano and then to think that he could just sit down someplace and just do it. And, and you know, and like people, I, you know, it's supposed to be, it's a musician, suppose it's a terrible job. They sort of complain about it. There's that song, Piano Man by Billy Joel, that makes you just sound like selling out and dead end and just a very depressing song. But to me, just, uh, sit down at a thing made out of wood and metal and stretched um, wire and little strikers and be able to coax all that out of it. And, uh, you know, and people, people come up and say, play this song, and if you do it nice, they give you a tip. I, it just seems like heaven to me. I don't know, I just really would like that. It seems so simple by comparison. I think that every designer who's good has a point of view. Inherent in that point of view is a predisposition to design things a certain way and that's not necessarily a good thing you know if if you just repeat yourself over and over again it's boring if you have certain things that you think always work it becomes a crutch and it inhibits your ability to make new discoveries um, on the other hand um, uh, every good designer I know they're, they're, they're like almost all of them, when you see their work, you either can tell that they did it, or when you find out that they did it, it makes sense. You think, oh, of course, you know, it's like a, it's like handwriting, it's like a signature. So I think all of us as designers have this tension that we have to resolve between, um, you know, figuring out what our characteristic way of approaching a design problem is that's unique for us, and figuring out how we can continuously be original in the way that we seek those solutions so that there's the element of surprise always available in each new um, thing that we do. Design Observer, uh, the blog I work on with Bill Drentel, Jessica Helfand, and uh, founded about um, almost, I guess, 10 years ago, 2003. Um, 
started out just as a little hobby that uh, the three of us had with uh, Rick Pointer, who was the fourth founder. Um, and these when blogs were still fairly new, um, and all three of, well, uh, Rick was a real writer, but Jessica, Bill, and I were all actually designers who just liked to write. And um, so we started doing it, and it uh, really just started as, like, it wasn't a money-making scheme. It wasn't even, we weren't even planning on, um, you know, becoming famous or anything. I just liked doing it because there were no deadlines, uh, and you got, um, the minute you finished it, you could publish, the minute you finished a piece, you could publish it, and the world could see it to the degree the world was watching, which they weren't back in those days. And even even now, it's like, a, you know, it's it's got a big circulation now, but still, you know, it's not like, you know, uh, um, you know, the New York Times website or CNN.com or ESPN.com by a long shot, you know. So it's a, it's a modest site, but within a, within a specialized audience, I think it's a... Uh, pretty well regarded. But what I liked about it was the um, being able to publish immediately, then also the feedback you would get with comments. You'd find out what people thought about what you wrote, and that would be interesting as well. And um, uh, at the very beginning, when it was just the four of us writing, uh, I really, there's a lot of pressure to just kind of keep producing material for it, or else it would just, you know, you know it would just sit there and not have new material on it. Now, um, uh, Mostly thanks to Builder and Tell, it's expanded quite a bit. So we have lots and lots and lots of contributors contributing in all sorts of different fields, including uh, urban planning. Um, uh, there's a whole track that we have talking about social design for the public good, and um, you know, expanding beyond graphic design to industrial design and architecture and all these other fields as well. And so that pressure to um, uh, to produce, you know, for any one of us is much less now than it was um, way back when the thing was brand new. And as a result, I don't write for it as much as I used to. Uh, you know, I used to just regularly have something every two to three weeks just because uh, otherwise there'd be nothing to look at when you went there. And now it's, uh, uh, I produce much, much, much shockingly less uh, material for it. But well, one of my New Year's resolutions was to write more for it this year coming up in uh, 2012, and I hope to do that. I have a couple of things that I'm working on.